December 28, 2019, 259 days ago. An embarrassing defeat at the hands of the eventual national champions. December 29, 2019. Work begins on the chase for next year's championship. So what's happened in the last 258 days? Well, we've seen transfers, injuries, a new coach with a familiar face, four NFL draft picks, highlights, recruits, award watch lists, shutdowns, reopenings, summer workouts, positive tests, negative tests, Zoom press conferences, masks, schedule changes, opt-outs, and a march for social justice. But today, it's game day. The Sooner Schooner rides again as OU takes on the Missouri State Bears. Turner Yell is back. Rambo is back. Humphrey is back. And so are we. This is Game Day U. apprehension amidst the pandemic afflicted world here we are in one sense everything's changed but in another sense nothing has it's saturday it's september and it's the sooner state welcome to the university of oklahoma folks we're playing football today live from the shadow of the palace on the prairie this is game day U, alongside shannon Earhart and kemper ball i am parker thune guys how excited are we i legitimately never thought we were going to see this game day i'm I completely shocked I can't believe it's finally here. I'm literally on my heels for tomorrow. I can't wait. Pleasantly surprised. Well, the Big Ten isn't playing football. The Pac-12's not playing football. So much has happened, especially over the last month, in terms of what the landscape of college football looks like, who's playing, who's not playing, which conferences and which teams are deciding, you know what, we're going to sit this one out. We're not going to play in 2020. Let's talk about some of the changes that we're going to see on the field as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Shannon Kemper. What are you most excited to see or most eager to see in terms of how football is going to be different post COVID-19? Okay, so they're using electronic whistles. I don't know if you guys have heard, but there's been a lot of issues with it. They're kind of nervous because when you blow the whistle, like water droplets can come out and that can be a huge thing, obviously with coronavirus and everything. Um, but it's attached to their waist now, so they don't click it at the wrong time or anything. But the problems are that coaches are having trouble hearing the whistle. It's very quiet. And you saw that in the Central Arkansas Austin P game. And it's also potential safety issues because, you know, some players hear the whistle while some players don't. And, you know, that's when somebody could get rocked. Not a great situation. But I'm excited to see what the electronic whistle is going to bring. I feel like it's going to be very interesting. I'm wondering if there's going to be issues tomorrow or what we're going to see out of that. It's the kind of thing that, like, you wouldn't have really considered before coronavirus. Like, I never would have thought about electronic whistles making the game safer somehow. Oh, I it'll, didn't even know it was a thing. It'll be interesting to see how they function, you know, in different weather conditions, you know, different game situations. That's going to be really cool to see. Kemper, what do you think? What are you most eager to see? So mine's less of an eager and excitement. It's more of an interest. I'm really interested to see how we handle player positives, how just college football in general handles player positives. And putting aside legitimate, real health concerns that the virus brings, just testing positive, even if they get better, you know, that's a week that they miss. You know, if your starting quarterback misses a few game because he tests positive for COVID, that's really gonna make you upset. That's gonna hurt a fan base and a team. And you can do, I mean, these guys can be doing everything right. You see coaches at practice wearing masks, you see the players wearing masks. They can be doing everything right and still get infected and still have to miss games. We've seen three Big 12 games get pushed back to a week already. Scheduling could be an issue. So all I'm hoping and all I'm asking is that those Sooner players, please stay away from Campus Corner. Don't go anywhere near it. Keep yourself safe. Keep yourself healthy. Definitely, there's much to consider. And you know, in terms of players avoiding the virus, it almost seems like as much as you do, 
As much as is within your power to do, there's always that element that's out of your control. Now, what I'm most eager to see is how these preeminent players across college football who have opted out, what the future looks like for them and how it affects their NFL draft stock, if at all. And I think that discussion has to start with two players in particular, last year's defending Belenikoff Award winner in Jamar Chase of LSU and the Sooners' own Kennedy Brooks, two guys with a bright NFL future, guys who have established themselves as some of the top skill position players in college football. Obviously, Chase was Joe Burrow's go-to guy in LSU's vaunted pass attack last year that culminated in a 15-0 record and a national championship. And then Brooks, coming off two consecutive 1,000-yard campaigns for the Sooners, was expected to be the bell cow after Trey Sermon transferred this past offseason, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. But you think about Micah Parsons at Penn State, Panay Sewell at Oregon, some of these guys that won't have the opportunity to hit the field at the collegiate level in 2020. What does the future look like for them, and what does college football look like? How do their teams address the fact that they won't be a part of the program here in the 2020 season? Obviously, the Sooners with Brooks as much affected by that reality as anybody. Yeah, I... I, there was certain guys that I was a little surprised to see opt out, and certain guys like Chuba Hubbard at Oklahoma State. I was shocked didn't opt out. That's a guy who's best running back in the country already, guaranteed first round <clears throat> draft pick. I have no idea why he came back. I respect that he came back, but you know, for these other guys that maybe haven't made that impact on the NFL draft scouts yet, I get it. You know, it, it's just super important that you get to see some playing time this year. You get some reps in. You show those guys what you can do. I think it's tough on the coaches too and the other players that aren't playing as much that they don't get to be with their best guys and they don't get to see their junior senior year now that they're upperclassmen it's just a tough look for everybody so hopefully they're still on the sidelines still cheering on their team which they obviously will be but it's just kind of sad to have to be like uh oh, coronavirus getting in the way of everything yeah absolutely well throughout the off season across the country the most the two most prominent topics of discussion have been, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and the social justice movement. And listen, we have two hours to devote to covering the Oklahoma game that's going to occur later this evening against Missouri State, as well as all the other games happening across the nation. But I think we'd be remiss if we didn't take at least a moment to address the social justice movement and how Lincoln Riley and the Sooners have taken part in it. Now, of course, Riley led a march just two weeks ago to the Unity Garden in the center of the campus's South Oval with his players. Here's what he had to say in the midst of that demonstration. Organization is made up of just about every different background that you can imagine. Females, males, people of all kinds of different skin colors, ethnicities, backgrounds, home lives, experiences, everything different. And those conversations have been tough. They've been raw and unfiltered. They've been eye-opening, very emotional, very tense. Now, regardless of your personal politics in terms of the social justice movement, what I think has become really clear, Shannon and Kemper, is that in Lincoln Riley, Oklahoma has found a leader not just on the football field, but off. He's very much a player's guy and a guy that wants his locker room unified not just in terms of what's happening on the football field, but in terms of their entire experience as collegiate athletes and as individuals in this country. Yeah, so going off of that, I think it's absolutely fantastic that Lincoln Riley can be an exemplar for his team, both on and off the field, as Parker was saying. It's just crazy to me that his players look up to him so much and that he's able to lead a team through every step of the way and through the action that he's taken. I know there's been a lot of meetings, and it's been a lot of listening for Lincoln Riley versus more taking action, letting his players call the shots versus him like infiltrating something else. I think that it's really cool that Lincoln is able to do that and able to be in the locker room because I know it's so different being in the locker room and seeing it from the outside. It's just a huge contrast. And being in the locker room with those incredible guys and having to go through this whole thing is just it's a lot and it's hard to take in especially as a coach so I think that he's doing a great job I think the march was a great idea and I think that if we just keep this mentality and we keep a positive attitude and we keep establishing peace that it's all going to work out in the end and that people are going to finally start to get it yeah I mean the the things that we've been seeing over 
the few the past few months are just so much bigger than football, so much more important than football. You know, the things that we've seen in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the, thing, the ni over 90 straight days of protests in Portland, Oregon, and it's crossed over into sports, and these are athletes that were never expected to have to talk about these things, but it is unbelievably inspiring and admirable to watch them talk about it. The WNBA has been leading this charge in social justice for years, and to see the rest of the sports world catch up, watching the Milwaukee Bucks not take the floor a few weeks ago in a playoff game over the shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, was inspiring. I have so much more respect for what these athletes are doing off the field than anything they could ever do on the field. It is amazing, and I think if people just took a little more time to listen to what they're saying, to listen to what these players, what these people are fighting for, what they're protesting for, what they're asking for, I think they would understand where they're coming from. Definitely a conversation that will continue to play out throughout the season and beyond the season across the country. Well, we'll reorient coming up next here on Game Day U, as we mentioned already. No Trey Sermon, no Kennedy Brooks for the Sooners in 2020. Where does that leave Oklahoma in terms of the backfield picture? We'll discuss next. Good morning, Game Day U. I'm reporting from Campus Corner, where tomorrow morning Sooner fans will see some major changes to their usual game day. The streets, Asp and Boyd will be closed off from traffic as usual on game day, but the Campus Corner Merchants Association will be providing outdoor seating in the new open space. The association is also providing a jumbotron to be set up in the Hertz Donut parking lot for fans to come and watch the game. Earlier this week, Norman City Council did pass that bars and restaurants would be allowed to operate at 75% capacity rather than the original 50%. I spoke with the manager of the Mont who says he's unsure of the customer turnout tomorrow. I, I really don't know. It's kind of up in the air. You know, we're planning for a decent day, but we're also not shooting for a lot extra because we're trying to keep our social distancing. And so we're keeping in our tables spread out and everything like that. So we're down a lot of seats, but we still expect a good day. I mean, one, the weather's going to be gorgeous. People are going to be in town. And so everybody in town, of course, is excited for Sooner football. Parker, other policies that are still in place include wearing a mask when you're not seated at your table. Groups larger than 10 may not be permitted and expect to see longer wait times as you head to watch the game. Reporting from Campus Corner, Lindsay Gibbs, Game Day U. Welcome back to Game Day U. Just a stone's throw from Owen Field as we count you down to Oklahoma and Missouri State this evening. Plenty ahead on the show, but right now, once again, we're here with Shannon Earhart and Kemper Ball in the studio. And guys, let's get a little bit more into this running back room because there's a lot up in the air here, obviously. Kennedy Brooks opted out of the 2020 season. Trey Sermon now an Ohio State Buckeye. I would imagine he's having his share of regrets about that decision <laughs> after the Big Ten canceled its season. But here we are, and Oklahoma heads into game day with the Bears with a very inexperienced quartet of running backs on the depth chart. Let's just start right there. Where does Trey, where does Trey Sermon's loss impact the Sooners most in your eyes? Well, as you just said, it's a lot of freshmen and a lot of underclassmen in the backfield. And losing that veteran explosiveness is just, it's key. He was such a plug that's really going to be missed. And he was so good ever since freshman year and only progressed up. He provides absolutely electric routes at the perfect time. And he's not afraid to absolutely rip through defenders. Also, I don't know if you guys knew, but he's been in the playoff mix since his freshman year, which is insane. And he's always been good at running the ball for big games and extending the passing play. He's not afraid to do that either and kind of just transitioning into Kennedy Brooks. Losing a two-time, a thousand yard rusher puts a wrench in the returning, in the running production running backs for OU, which is just gonna be, it's it's upsetting. It it's not it's not a great thing, especially since he was on track to be one of the best running backs in Sooner history. So having those two guys gone is just it's a tough look. It's a tough look. And especially having one of them go to the Big Ten where the conference, as you already said, isn't even playing. I don't know, I would be I'd be a little nervous right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing you would say you lose from Kennedy Brooks and Trey Sherman is experience. I mean, if there's one place you want 
experience on your depth chart. It's your quarterback and your running backs. And that's going to really hurt that's going to really hurt the Sooners this year. You know, we've got some guys that are going to have to step up big. Next man up has been a very important mentality at OU the last few years. You know, when Baker was leaving, it was next man up, it was Kyler's turn. When D.D. Westbrook left, it was next man up, it was Hollywood's turn. You know, we've done this before. We've seen this. We've seen this specifically at the running back position. We've seen guys step up in big moments. And that's just what we're going to need this year. I think it's more important what we have surrounding those running backs. We've got a great offensive line returning. We've got a great guy at quarterback that's gonna draw a lot of attention. And most importantly, we've got a great coach in Lincoln Riley who's gonna get real creative this year. It's maybe his toughest coaching challenge yet, but I am so excited to watch him live up to it. Yeah, I'm excited to see him get creative too. I think that's gonna be really interesting. He's gonna to have see to. How he, yeah, how he bobs and weaves around with new players and you know that he can do it. Solid coach. If Everybody there, knows that. If there's one guy in the country that I believe in to get creative, it's definitely Lincoln, Lincoln Riley. Riley. Well, one thing, Kemper and Shannon, that I don't think we're talking about enough in terms of the turnover in the running back room is who's going to be the read option back in the Sooner offense because they lose two backs that were very experienced in the read option game. And it's a hard play to run. It's a play that Lincoln Riley has utilized extensively in his offense over the three seasons he's been head coach at Oklahoma. But it's a difficult maneuver to master. And when you lose two guys in Kennedy Brooks and Trey Sermon that both had plenty of experience in that scheme. It's a huge question mark when you have to insert a guy like TJ Pledger or Marcus Major. Outside of Brooks and Sermon, the Sooners don't bring back a running back from the 2019 squad that logged more than 10 carries. So there is significant inexperience and just in terms of the way that Lincoln Riley has set his offense up and as heavily as he has relied on the read option in years past, it's going to be really interesting for me to see how these backs step up to accommodate their game to the read option style of offense and who it is that steps up as that guy more so than the rest. Now with that said, who emerges in your mind with the most touches out of this Sooner running back room in 2020? You've got several candidates. TJ Pledger, obviously the most experienced. Ramondre Stevenson averaged eight yards a carry last year in limited playing time. And then you got the newcomer, Seth McGowan, as well as Marcus Major, the hometown kid from Oklahoma City. Shannon, who do you like? Marcus Major, I'm a hometown type of girl, even though I'm not from here still. I think that he's going to get the most touches for sure. And even though he only played three games, having that be 28 yards on 10 carries, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't great, but I still think that this year he's going to be able to step up, especially with Stevenson not being out or being out for the first five games. I think that he's going to see playing time early and that even though he got injured last year, I think he's come back stronger and I think that he has a lot to bring to the table. Also, it might be a hot take, but I'm going to compare him to Adrian Peterson. Okay. Adrian Peterson has Whoa. He, wow Adrian now. Peterson Whoa. phenomenal. I think Marcus Major has very high potential, and he plays invincible. He has a strong lower body. He's a shorter guy, and especially with that stature, I think that he can really just plow through defenders, just like Adrian Peterson. So I think that if I was Marcus Major, I would be looking up to Peterson and maybe comparing myself to him as a redshirt freshman. Hot take, but I'm gonna stay by it. That is uh, that is that is hollowed ground. That Adrian Peterson the name. Hottest I know, of take. We, I know. Don't, we don't we don't touch that very often, but. I do agree with you. I'm also going with Marcus Majors. I would never pick against someone from Oklahoma City. Never pick against a fellow Oklahoma City boy. But I like Majors. I like the way he fits into Lincoln's offense. I think he's going to allow us to, like we were just talking about, Lincoln getting creative. I think we're going to be able to work him into the passing game a little bit. I think it's going to be something that a lot of people don't expect. But what I really, but what I, what I like about Majors and Seth McGowan, our two running backs, is. It's just kind of a coin flip between those two right now. I think either one of them could break out and be a star, but that one year of experience, even though Majors was a red shirt last year, that's still a year in the program. That's a year of practicing against college guys. It's just a different level than high school. I think that year of experience is gonna be enough to just nudge Seth McGowan, nudge Seth McGowan out of the way for the most touches. TJ Pledger's a great back. I just think he's more of a feature back and not your workhorse, you know what I mean? I would agree. I think you're saying with the comfortability level now that he does have a year behind him, mm -hmm. that he's just he's more he has more chemistry with the guys and he's able to gel more and just finally like have that like moment of like, yes, now I'm in, now I'm just gonna absolutely dominate. He's so. got all the talent in the world, he just needs that moment and now he's got it. Agreed. Especially after the release of the Sooners initial depth chart on Wednesday. Here's what I'm saying, Shannon and Kemper. Put some respect on TJ Pledger's name. 
because I think a lot of people have forgotten just how good this kid is. And granted, we haven't seen it a whole lot yet at Oklahoma. He's been utilized more in a special teams role than anything else. We haven't seen him accumulate a whole bunch of carries on the offensive side of the football as of yet, but I think that's poised to change. We forget he was one of the top five running backs in his recruiting class has just never really been given the opportunity to carve out much of a role at Oklahoma, and that's really not his fault. He sat behind two outstanding backs in Trey Sermon and Kennedy Brooks. But here's the thing. I think a lot of people assumed that heading into this year, as soon as Brooks opted out, that Pledger was just going to hold down the fort until Ramondre Stevenson returned from suspension, at which point he would be the main cog in the backfield. If the depth chart, if the release of the depth chart told me anything on Wednesday, it's that T.J. Pledger beat out Ramondre Stevenson on talent alone. The fact that Ramondre Stevenson, Ronnie Perkins, and Trajan Bridges were listed on the depth chart, to me, is evidence that T.J. Pledger proved that he's more capable of carrying the load in the Oklahoma backfield than Ramondre Stevenson. So much as we saw Stevenson in a change of pace role last year, I think we're going to see that roll over into 2020. And I think we see Pledger shoulder the load as the feature back until he proves that he can't do so. I, if that moment ever comes. I, I can absolutely see all that stuff happening. You know, I, I like Pledger. I think he's a good back. But I keep thinking back to a few years ago, an early season game that we played against West Virginia. And afterward, we were all asking, who is this Samaj P. Ryan guy? I feel like at OU, these running backs, they come out of the woodwork. They come out of nowhere every year. It happens every couple of years that a new star em emerges in our backfield. And that's where I like Majors and McGowan. Speaking of new emergence, Let's talk about the Sooners' new running backs coach, Love DeMarco it. Murray, oh, the returning yeah. legend, just three years removed from a decorated NFL career. At age 32, he steps into his new role as the running backs coach at the University of Oklahoma under Lincoln Riley's staff. Of course, he had the same position last year at the University of Arizona, so he's got a bit of coaching experience, but still a very young guy, a guy that you would imagine will be able to relate to his players a little bit more just based on his age oh, and the yeah. recency of his experience on the gridiron. So as Murray steps in, what do you think the biggest impact will be in terms of what he brings to the table? Uh, for me, I think, uh, you know, he, he, was a, he was a good coach at Arizona. He took their elusive rating from 99th to 23rd. He's an OU legend, but I think the biggest thing that he – gains moving from Arizona to Oklahoma is just, you know, more assets. He's got more talented backs. He's got more, he's got more things to work with there. But I, I like what you said about him relating to players, you know, young guy, tons of experience. Not a lot of, not a lot of colleges in the country can say they have a former NFL rushing champion coaching their running backs. That I, I feel like he could make up some of the some of the lack of experience that we were just talking about that our young running backs really bring us. Yeah, and going off of that, I think that since he has sooner experience, it's his home away from home. He's just an absolute dominant coach, and he was a dominant player when he was at OU. And returning to his alma mater, I think really helps with comfortability and confidence in the lineup. And I do think that he's going to be able to teach, as we were talking about just a second ago, Marcus Major and TJ Fletcher how to be uh, how to return and kickoffs and bring up their average a bunch because he was the all-time leader when he was at OU and he's also one of OU's all-time best backs ever. I think that he is a, or he has a career he's a career leader in all-purpose yards and has a career in as a career leader in TDs. But I think that he's going to be able to get their heads in the game because he is a player's coach and because he knows what he's doing and he knows how to work with his players, especially since now he's been at OU, he's now the running back coach, and now that he's in the lineup, I think that he's going to be able to really mix things up a little bit. And especially coming from Arizona, I think that he's going to have a lot more to work with and he's going to be more excited because I think players are a lot better here versus Arizona. I think we can all agree on that. So I think it's going to be interesting seeing him mix it up. Yep. One thing I think is very understated about DeMarco Murray is that he's extremely intelligent. Between his NFL career and taking the running backs coach job at the University of Arizona, he spent a year in the broadcast booth to rave reviews, really. Everybody, I think, was very much impressed with the knowledge that DeMarco Murray has and the intuition that he possesses in terms of his ability to understand and comprehend the game and see the angles that not many others can see, which I think you can mostly chalk that up to his experience as a running back 
and the vision and the intelligence that you have to have in order to be as successful as DeMarco Murray was, both at the collegiate level and the NFL level. Now, for me, I'm really excited to see what he does with Seth McGowan, the true freshman who probably won't stand to see that many touches this year in the Oklahoma offense, but could be a workhorse down the road. You look at what he was able to do in high school. You look at the tape. He's an overpowering back. He's shifty. Obviously, it hurt for the Sooners on National Signing Day in 2020 to see Jace McClellan flip to Alabama, but they got quite a guy in McGowan and a guy that is capable of being an every down back at the collegiate level. And hey, Kamar Wheaton's on the way. At least we can hope. His final three, Oklahoma, LSU, and Texas for the number two running back in the 2021 class. So the Sooners could be poised to land a five-star talent in the backfield. Hopefully, think, hopefully Murray can help boost those recruits a little bit. You know, maybe we can get get something rolling in the running back position, get a few new guys in here. Yeah, I think, I think he's really going to be able to form some really solid players out of that. So I'm excited to see that happening. But man, it's that, about time. When he was here, God, Demarco Murray had just just tore talent, it up, just tore talent up. that you cannot teach. He was so shifty. He was one of my favorite OU players to watch when I was I a kid. I think so I was too. He, with DeMarco he just Murray. had such crazy moves, bunch of flips, just bunch of. I random think, actions that you just pulled out of nowhere. I think I still have a children's size number seven OU jersey laying around <laughs> somewhere. I personally can't wait to see DeMarco Murray's flips as a coach yes, as sir. opposed to as a player. He'll but do it. <laughs> Missouri State has rolled in. They're here ready to take on the Oklahoma Sooners at 6 p.m. tonight. Coming up next here on Game Day U, we'll toss it down to Studio A, where Tyler DeLuca and the gang will take it from there. Welcome back to Game Day U, the one and only student-produced pregame show at the University of Oklahoma. My name is Tyler DeLuca, and I'm joined here in the studio by Ben Thomas and Jesse Klinger. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing pretty good. I'm just pumped that Sooner football is back. I've been waiting for this day. Like Kemper said earlier, I didn't think we were going to see it either, but I am stoked. I'm ready for a big Sooner win today. Yeah, me too. I'm really excited for what the season's going to look like. Obviously, it's going to look a little different, but... I'm hopeful on what we're going to see today. Okay, well, they're excited. I'm absolutely psyched. So let's jump into some of the biggest questions facing college football today. First up, as we know, the Pac-12 and Big Ten both suspended their season for the fall. So which program do you think was impacted the most by this cancellation? Well, I think there's a lot of big choices you could go with here, but mine is Ohio State. I think it's a big, obvious choice here. They just recently came off a disappointing loss to Clemson in the college football playoffs. They have Justin Fields, who was a Heisman projected quarterback, projected first round pick. He's a big arm, mobile quarterback, poised for a Heisman year. And obviously with Trey Sermon joining the backfield, they were gonna have another J.K. Dobbins to have an explosive running back off the backfield. We obviously won't see that. We might see it in the spring. We don't know yet, but that was another guy who went to that school to improve his draft stock and is really hurt by the Big Ten and Pac-12 not playing. And they have the number five recruiting class coming in to contribute. They're not going to be able to play. They have to sit around and wait a year, which kind of hurts them in that sense. But I think Ohio State is going to be the biggest, biggest loss here because they were guaranteed college football playoff spot coming this in whatever, January or February, whenever bowl season is. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Ohio State is going to hurt a bit. But when it comes to my pick, I'm going to have to go with the University of Minnesota. Minnesota was 19 in the, AP, in the Associated Press top 25, going 11 to 2 last season. They tied for second place in the Big Ten Conference, just behind us, Ohio State. And they haven't been a big name in the past, but they are up and coming, and they were really building some momentum last season, especially after beating Penn State 31 to 26 last season. That was a that was a pretty good game, and with. With not having their regular fall season, they're already losing players like junior wide receiver Rashad Bateman, who was a power player last season. And he announced early in August that he was forgoing his remaining eligibility at the university to focus on training for the 2021 draft. And a lot of players throughout the Big Ten and Pac-12 are making the same decision as well. And that also leaves a lot of uncertainty for these teams if they end up playing in their spring season. And not only do I feel bad for these players who are missing their fall season, but I also feel bad for the seniors. Like, especially my brother, who's a senior at the University of Minnesota right now, 
he is not getting his senior football season, but hey, hopefully that means he'll cheer vicariously through me for the Sooners. True, and Minnesota is a really good choice there. Like you said, a very sneaky team, always gets a good upset win here and there. They're definitely a good pick for that. How about you, Tyler? Yeah, you know, I, I obviously see what you're saying with Ohio State. I mean, they have some great players that are missing out, but I'm going to go more with Jesse here, and I'm going to pick the Utah Utes. Mainly for the same reasons, because I look at it like this. The powerhouses, they're going to be fine. They, Ohio State's, Penn State's, their resumes speak for themselves. When you have the big brands like Michigan, Oregon, USC, they're going to be fine because their names ring across the nation. It's the teams that are trying to build momentum that will be hurt the most, such as Utah. There were points in last season where Utah looked like they were a viable option for a playoff spot to represent the Pac-12, but they just melted down towards the end of the season, losing to Oregon and then Texas in the Alamo Bowl. Don't get it twisted though, the Utes still had a fantastic season, especially for program standards. Utah hitting 11 wins was their best season since 2008. This was a great accomplishment for this team and they needed to build off this. They needed to go and say, you know what recruits, let's make this the norm. But now how much of that momentum will still be there come 2021 after a full season's break? And I'm worried that Utah might just kind of return back to the mediocrity that they were at coming back to the 2021 season. Yeah, they were definitely a rising team, a team that was really going to be able to compete with Oregon for that Pac-12 title. They have a lot of experience. They're mm -hmm. a really good experienced team. I'm wondering if with this season not happening, happening, if they're going to lose that. Guys going to the draft, they're going to lose some of that experience that they were really building off of. So I, I agree with you. I think that's a really good pick coming from the Pac-12. Yeah, I agree as well. And a lot of this uncertainty with you know, players going to the draft early, it makes you wonder what's going to happen next fall too. Yeah. Are they going to get a lot of recruits for not having a fall season? Are they going to have a big coming in, big freshman incoming team? Who knows what's in store for them? Yeah, absolutely. And with that cancellation of those two conferences, that leaves one spot in the playoff that will not be filled by a Power 5 conference champion. So, do you guys see a conference getting two teams in? Or do you see a non-Power 5 team sneaking into that last playoff spot? Um, I think the obvious choice here, I'm going with the SEC. I think the SEC will get their last spot. They are, I'm sorry, Sooner fans, they are in the best conference in football. The SEC is the best conference. But they have four teams in the top 10 right now. LSU, Bama, Florida, and Georgia. Auburn's another sneaky team. Tennessee is on the rise. I mean, there are so many teams you could pick and choose from to put into that last spot. I think it will be a battle to the end with the SEC playing a full conference schedule this year, which we haven't really seen in, a pa in the past. We'll have Alabama and LSU. They'll be playing tougher teams now. And I really think you might actually see a two-loss team getting in this time just because that the SEC strength of schedule is so much harder than, more, than most schedules in college football. And so I think my final prediction is that Bama and Florida get in as my, last, as my two teams that make the spot from the SEC. I have to agree, Ben. I think the SEC is also going to pull two spots this year, and it's not going to be the first time it happens. They've done it before in 2018, where Georgia and Alabama both made it into the playoffs. And now that the Big Ten and Pac-12 aren't competing, it's even a higher odds of them getting in that second spot. I mean, Georgia almost snuck into the playoffs last season, and, they, and the SEC has the most national championships in the past years, and again, the most first round draft picks this year. And I mean, Georgia dominated in the Sugar Bowl against Baylor last year going 12 to two. I mean, like you said, Georgia might have a chance again. And as for LSU, they were a powerhouse season. I mean, they took the championship, but there's a lot of uncertainty with the LSU team this year. And I'm not saying a non-Power 5 team might not make it, but I mean, face the facts. It's it's, it's going to be the SEC. It's the SEC. It's the SEC. Okay, well, I would like to absolutely commend you guys for going out on a limb and picking such an unknown conference like the SEC. <laughs> that doesn't get covered enough. You're welcome. But I am taking it to the East Coast. I'm going with the ACC. So let's get the first team out of the way. It's obvious. The Clemson Tigers are a lock to be in the playoffs this year. They have Trevor Lawrence back. I mean, do I need to say anything else? They have Trevor Lawrence back. He's going to be dotting defenses up like it's nothing. They have Trevor Etienne to absolutely punish defenses. He's going to be slashing through, and it's, he's just a powerhouse. But just because Clemson is just because Clemson is in the playoffs does not mean they will be the ACC champions. So give me the North Carolina Tar Heels to take that fourth playoff spot. Now, Mac Brown has turned this program around like it. it it's an, it's incredible what he's done in the very short amount of time that he's been there. 
Sam Howell and the offense are poised to be electric again this year, but more on that later. Now you have their defense. You have Chaz Surratt at that middle linebacker spot who is an anchor. You can catch him on every defensive award list. He is there. They have a young defensive line, but their secondary is solid. I expect North Carolina to pose a huge threat, a huge threat to the Clemson Tigers after being so close, after being so close to beating the Clemson Tigers last year. I expect them to be there again. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting pick there with UNC, but... I mean, like you said, they were close to being Clemson last year. I think they might have a chance. I would be stoked to see them pull it off, but Clemson just seems too overpowered. But I think that's a solid pick. I agree it's a solid pick, too. Like, like I said, they might have a chance. But, again, I'm going to leave it up to experience, and the SEC has that in the bag. Yeah, but I'm just saying, the SEC, like you said, they are going to be playing each other this season. For like the first time really ever, they're playing a full SEC schedule. And with that, I honestly expect teams to really knock each other out. I think the SEC will be their worst enemy this year when it comes to the playoff time. And North Carolina and Clemson are easily the top two teams. They are the top tier teams in, this, uh, in the Atlantic Coast Conference. But obviously, this is a crazy year. You know, we, we don't know what's gonna happen. The fact we're even discussing this is insane. So there's gonna be some teams that get the short end of the stick. And so what do you think is going to be the biggest difference, the biggest negative for these teams or conferences that they're going to face this year? I think the biggest thing will be probably not playing in the college football playoffs. I think the NCAA will continue to have just their four teams, their regular college football playoffs, and the Pac-12 and Big Ten will end up missing out on that. I think, like I said, I think they should just play it out normal. I, it's been working well in the past. There's no need for an expansion. I know people have talked about eight teams or 12 teams, and it seems like 2020 would be the year to do that, but I really don't think they should really be switching anything up. Now for the Big Ten and Pac-12, I could see them, if they play in the spring or later on, I could see them doing their own kind of little tournament, maybe the number one from the Pac-12 and number one from Big Ten face off, and the same thing working its way down. I think the Big Ten would probably dominate the Pac-12 if that were to happen, but at least it gives those guys a chance to play some playoff football, gives them a little more experience, and also will help their draft stock in the end a little bit if they're on the bubble for a first round or a second round or whatever. So I think the NCAA has opportunities to really incorporate the Big Ten and Pac-12, even though they're not playing in the normal football season. Yeah, I agree, that makes sense. And like you said, I agree that they should try to stick to pretending like it's a normal season as usual. There's a lot of uncertainty, but I don't think that means any players or coaches should go changing their game for the pandemic. Now, you talk about playoffs, but I think it's the top players that are going to be really impacted. And with teams not playing and players opting out, we're going to be seeing some more action from smaller teams so, and like non-Power 5 teams like Boise State, UCF, BYU. They might have these powerhouse players that we don't even know about yet. Who knows what kind of talent we're going to see. And at the same time, I feel really, I just feel really bad for the top players who don't get another season, especially the seniors who wanted their last chance to make a really good impression before their drafts. And we have players deciding that, like Jamie Newman, Kennedy Brooks, and Micah Parsons, they all decided that their 29th season was a great way to go out. And so they're opting out and going for the draft early. And I wish the best of luck to them. Yeah, and I'm going to kind of look at this from a broader perspective. I don't think there is a conference hurt more than the Big Ten in this. And like you, you talked about it earlier, Ohio State was poised to be incredible this year. They have contenders in that conference. They have a little bit of everything. And with Ohio State, you're losing out on the last year of a lot of people. Justin Fields is going to probably go to the draft. And we see that how, we, we look, if you look at the rankings, they have six teams in the top 25. Those, bowl, those were all going to be in bowl games more than likely. Penn State could have possibly been contending for that playoff spot in an unlikely upset of Ohio State. But now, they don't get any of that. And I don't think a conference is hurt more across the board than the Big Ten. You also see teams like Michigan State and Rutgers who have fresh new coaches in there and that aren't going to be able to establish a system. So not only are they going to be hurt this year, but those teams that are trying to establish new norms are going to be hurt for the foreseeable future as well, trying to establish those coaches, those systems, those type of things. And, as, and especially in a conference like the Big Ten that is already so tough, any, any type of hindrance like that is going to absolutely be a killer to your program. But we're going to take a timeout, but when we return, we'll give our picks for the winner of this year's Heisman Trophy. Get ready to be back.
welcome back to the Gaylord Hall Studios. It is time for Three and Out, where we answer three pressing questions from the college football world. First, let's discuss something OU knows extremely well at this point. Who is going to be taking home the Heisman Trophy in December? I might be a little biased here, but I think the obvious choice is OU's very own Spencer Rattler. I mean, how could I not be biased? Two out of the last three years, OU has won the Heisman. Last year being Jalen Hurts, he came in second place. Spencer Rattler was a redshirt freshman last year, only got in a couple games, but did get in the bowl game against LSU. But overall, he went 7 for 11 with 81 yards and a touchdown in his redshirt season. He has Lincoln Riley's head coach with the number one offense in football. Every year he's been the head coach. The kid got a year to sit behind Jalen Hurts, learn from experience, learn this offense, learn this playbook. And I think he's just going to ball out. He's got a big arm, explosive arm. His feet are a little slower than like we've seen with Kyler Murray or Jalen Hurts, but he can still run the ball. The, the read option plays will still be in effect. And the players have said that he kind of brings a little bit of a Baker mentality into practice and into the huddle. He's a fiery attitude. I really think he could just take off and continue just leading us on and really start his era, the Rattler era, off with a bang and winning the Heisman. But that's just me. I hate, I don't want to disagree with you here because I'm a big, big Sooners fan, but I'm going to have to go with Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence. He is one of the biggest stars in the football game this year with a wickedly talented arm. In 2018, he won the ACC Rookie of the Year and helped bring home the national championship as a freshman. He helped Clemson reach the title for the first time since 1985, going 15-0 in the modern era. He came in seventh in the running for Heisman last year, and I think he can take it first place this year for Clemson. He's entering the season with 527 of 800. 104 career passes for 6,945 yards with 66 touchdowns with 12 interceptions and 1,610 snaps in 30 career games, 26 of which were starts. He has 967 rushing yards and 10 rushing touchdowns on 163 carries. I think he's going to be one of the biggest stars and a big talking point this season. He played phenomenally with Clemson last year, and I think he can do even better this year, and that he has a great shot for the Heisman. That, and he has pretty awesome hair. And he was a big reason why college football is even happening. He was one of the few players to really speak out about wanting to play and getting us all here, especially on game day. That's true. Shout out to you, Trevor Lawrence. You're the real one. Yeah, you know, I have to disagree. Because, let me tell you right now, I get it. I understand your guys' picks. Spencer Rattler, we basically have the like Avatar Heisman stuff going on right now. Every quarterback that comes through here ends up in New York. Trevor Lawrence, that's a bad man right there. He is incredible. But I'm going with the dark horse pick. I said earlier that North Carolina, that North Carolina would be making the playoffs. They'd be that last spot. And that is because Sam Howell is going to win the Heisman this year. Who? Sam Howell. I'm sorry, one more time. Sophomore quarterback for the University of North Carolina. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. There's three S's that go into a Heisman campaign. First one is stats. And does Sam Howell know how to put up stats? As a true freshman, a true freshman, he put up 38 touchdowns and seven interceptions. As a true freshman. For comparison, Baker Mayfield in his junior year put up 40 touchdowns and eight interceptions the year before he won the Heisman. There's zero reason why Sam Howell can't make that same Heisman leap that we saw from Baker Mayfield. The second S is set up and North Carolina is set up. This offense is poised to be electric. Carolina is returning two 1,000 yard receivers in Diami Brown and Daz Newsome. Both are on the Blitnikoff Award watch list, so the weapons to put the stats up are in place. They're also returning four offensive linemen out of their five starters from last year. He's going to be protected, and he has the weapons. And the last S is storyline, and North Carolina has a storyline. Mac Brown has this team poised to take over the ACC, to end the tyrannical reign of the Clemson Tigers that has, that has gone on since 2015 at this point. North Carolina is going to take down the Clemson Tigers, and what better talking point could Sam Howell possibly have come December in New York than dethroning the champs of the ACC. Big Tar Heels guy, are you? So I abs? have to really disagree with you on that. I think, <laughs> I think sleeper picks are great, but I have to disagree with you on that. I cannot trust a UNC quarterback. 
I'm from Chicago. I cannot trust a UNC quarterback since Mitchell Trubisky came out of there. So I'm sorry. I don't care what system Mac Brown's got in place. I don't see how he has, I just don't think his weapons are as much as a Trevor Lawrence, as a Spencer Rattler, as like a Justin so Fields. Let me ask you He's this, got though. him, but I don't think let he me, has let, as much. Let me ask you this. All right. If you can't trust Sam Howell, who showed up last year as a true freshman, how do you trust Spencer Rattler? What has he done? What has Spencer Rattler done? How I can mean, you trust him? He was him? the number one QB in the, in the recruiting class. Mm -hmm. So that's already right there. He's put up, he broke record after record in Arizona as a high school quarterback. And he has learned this playbook. He has learned Lincoln Riley's playbook and he has been explosive when he's gotten his touches in those games. So I think he is gonna just be set and ready to go. Like you said, one of your S's was set up and he is more than set up. And I think set up more than a Sam Howell. Okay. I'm gonna have to lean a little bit more with Tyler okay. now what? okay like wow. he's right how can you trust Spencer Rattler you don't really have a lot of other experience to go off other than high school but at the same time I still can't agree with Sam Howell with you you Why talk not? about NC UNC beating the Clemson Tigers and I just cannot see that happening I mean Trevor Lawrence almost carried that team last year and I'm sorry it's just not gonna happen Tyler okay well no matter what, no matter who wins, we saw how big of an impact Mac Brown had on the Tar Heels as he came in as a new coach. So we see all the new coaches, the yearly coaching carousel has taken place. Which coach do you think will have the biggest impact on their new team this year? I think one coach that not a lot of people are talking about, but he went to the SEC, of course. is Lane <laughs> Kiffin of course at Ole SEC. Miss. Now, Ole Miss has had a few stretches here and there where they're really good, and they have been able to compete in the SEC. Recently, not so much. Been towards the bottom of the SEC, nothing really generating for him. But I think Lane Kiffin can come in, step in, and just bring a whole new dynamic to this team. In nine years as a head coach, he's 62-34, and 2-2 two two in bowl games. He brings a different kind of energy and mentality. His practices are fun. He's a fun energy guy. Players want to play for him, and they want to be successful under him as a head coach. I think he had, he's a really good at recruiting. His, he had a top five class at FAU in the Conference USA, and 17 out of 22 of his recruits that he brought in his very first year at FAU were three stars or better. O Ole Miss will have a few years to grow, and I think they got to give them some time, but they have already have some pieces in place with uh, Mingo at wide receiver. They got a couple other guys, but the SEC is tough, and you got to give these guys some years, but I think Lane Kiffin will step in and deliver and bring Ole Miss back to another team, just adding another team to compete in a very heavy SEC. I think you're almost dead on right about that, but I'm going to have to go with who everyone is talking about, and that is DeMarco Murray. Again, the 32-year-old running back coach, only coming out of only one year of coaching at the University of Arizona. I think he's going to do some great things for the Oklahoma Sooners. He played for the Sooners back in his high school days before he was drafted by the Cowboys in 2011. Did four seasons with the Cowboys, one season with the Eagles, and two last seasons with the Tennessee Titans before he retired in 2018, spending some time doing some broadcasting stuff. So, you know, this is a very intellectual guy when it comes to talking football. He knows what he's talking about, especially since he's still so fresh out of the game. He was an all pro running back in 2014 and on the offensive player of the year in 2014 as well. And it's a trend, successful players turn into successful coaches. I think he has fresh wisdom to share. And especially since he's only 32 years old, he's gonna connect really well with some of our younger players and they're gonna wanna talk to him and open up to him. And it's going to bring a whole new dynamic to the running backs of our team. In a press conference, he talked about how it was a dream of his to come back to Oklahoma and coach the school and program that built him. And I think that's going to be a really big payoff for the Sooners down the road, especially since he's going to attract a lot of new talent in future seasons. And I just really can't wait to see what he'll do with the team. Yeah, he's pumped to get in there and start recruiting guys and bringing in his own guys. I think he's a huge add to this Oklahoma staff that already seems to just have coach after coach after coach that's at the top of his game. Yeah, for sure. And I honestly, I love your Lane Kiffin pick just for the Egg Bowl, if nothing else. I am so excited to see Lane Kiffin go against Mike Leach. Who knows what those press days Lane are Lane Kiffin like. versus Nick Saban yeah, after oh, Nick Saban, oh, I can't you know, wait. attacked the, him. Going it's going to be, be fun. There's going to be plenty of trash talk. Yeah, SEC, okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to stick in the Big 12, and I'm going to go with new Baylor head coach Dave Aranda. And obviously there is a ton, and I mean a ton, of question marks around this Baylor team, but I think that he will keep them afloat. We saw Matt Rule leave to go to the NFL. He's now coaching 
the Carolina Panthers, but they also lost a lot of solid players to the NFL. But overall, I can see Aranda keeping this team near the top of the NFL. This is a coach hire for his de defensive schemes, and we know how valuable a good defensive scheme can be in the Big 12. And they only have two defensive starters returning. Like, that is not good, obviously. So they're going to need any ounce of brain power that Dave Aranda has on that defensive side to really stay afloat. So I absolutely see him making the biggest impact, even if they aren't as high as they were last year uh, in, the, in the rankings of making the Big 12 championship, for sure. Yeah, I think it'll be an interesting year for Baylor coming off, like you said, such a great year last year, almost making the playoffs, to now losing their head coach and losing a bunch of starters. I'm interested to see where they end up. I see them more of a middle pack Big 12 team yeah. this year. And with health and safety on the forefront of everything, which team do you think has been hurt the most by one of the opt-outs that we've seen this season? So, I mean, I hate to go SEC again, but oh the Georgia gosh. Bulldogs are really <laughs> going to be missing out. They lost graduate transfer Jamie Newman who was gonna, from Wake Forest who was going to jump in and be their guy. I think he was going to take this offense to a whole new level, better than what Jake Fromm did. And you kind of saw their offense get a little dull under Jake Fromm. They weren't as explosive as they were, let's say, against, against OU in the Rose Bowl. And now that he's gone, Jamie Newman was going to step in and really perform for them. In his three years at Wake Forest, he completed 60.5% of his passes for close to 4,000 yards with a touchdown interception ratio of 35 to 16. He can run the ball almost getting 1,000 yards with 10 scores last season. He can run, he can throw, he's got an explosive arm. And in the SEC, you need a high-powered offense to go along with Georgia's already dominant defense. So I really think he was crucial. Now they have a couple other quarterbacks they could bring in but they're not as explosive as a Jamie Newman. But as long as their defense holds up, I think they might be able to squeak in, but it'll really be how their quarterback play plays without Jamie Newman. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go SEC too with LSU. They've had four players decide to opt out. And last season, they had an amazing, amazing season taking the national championships. They were a powerhouse team. But I just don't see that happening this year. Wide receiver Jamar Chase has chosen to opt in out for the season. And he was a power player. I mean, a beast on the field last year. And I don't know what LSU is going to do without them. He took 1,780 yards and 20 touchdowns. Again, 20 touchdowns. But he chose he wants to focus on the 2021 draft. And I think he's going to have a great chance at that too. Don't get me wrong. but. I don't know what LSU is going to do. They're losing players left and right, and I don't know if even more players are going to choose to opt out or if that's even still an option. And like I said, I just don't really expect a lot from LSU this year. And my sister who went to LSU is probably going to kill me for saying that, but tell how I say it. Okay, I can't believe I'm saying this, but Ben, I agree with you. Uh, I'm going to, to the SEC. SEC I'm going to the SEC Let's as go. well. Wow. The Georgia Bulldogs were absolutely hurt the most by their opt out. We saw Jamie Newman opt out, and you, you gave the rundown perfectly. I mean, this is a guy who threw for nearly 3,000 passing yards, 26 touchdowns, and was poised to be the starter. But now, what do they have? They have JT Daniels, who is looking to be cleared a, a transfer from USC. He only got to play in one game last year before getting injured, but in his freshman year, he was pretty solid. 2,672 passing yards and a touchdown to inter interception ratio of 14 to 11. Obviously, that's not great, but honestly, at this point, with an opt-out so close to the season, the Georgia Bulldogs do not have much else to go to. And as we inch closer to the kickoff time, Parker, Shannon, and Kemper tell you what to expect as the Sooner season begins tonight. Hour two on game day U is off and running as we get closer and closer to the start of action between the Sooners and the Bears. Parker Thune alongside Shannon Earhart and Kemper Ball. Yes, sir. Guys, as we talked about at the open, COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on what the college football landscape will look like here in 2020. The college football that we've come to know and love is going to be drastically changed. So let's talk about how that affects the Sooners specifically. In terms of the product that we're going to see on the field and the environment that we're going to see in Gaylord Family, Oklahoma Memorial Stadium tonight against Missouri State, what is the biggest change, what's the biggest impact that COVID-19 has in your mind? What are you most concerned about? 
I think it's because we're not going to have Sooner Nation. I know the fans are always a cop out, but seriously, this time having no fans is going to be crazy. The fans always mess with both the visiting team's head and our head. It gives our team more of a hype and it gets us rowdy and it gets us going. And the visiting team, we can always heckle them and stuff. And it just, it gives them, it throws them off their game a little bit. And I think that will it still have an impact even though it's only 25 percent full will the fans be able to get the sooners going and get the get everybody else hyped and everything i don't know if i don't know if the fans not being there is going to have the biggest impact but i think that if sooner nation isn't there that it's still going to be a big deal and that it's just going to be weird seeing nobody in the stands we saw that last night with the chiefs game that it was just weird seeing the stadium only like not even half full like a fourth of the way full it's just it always messes with the team's head both the visiting team and our team oklahoma announced last month that they will cap stadium attendance at about 22 percent of sellout capacity kemper yeah um I think I think that fan impact is going to be huge. I agree with you completely. I mean, I, I think about games like the Kansas State game last year where it just didn't seem like we were there mentally. It didn't feel like we showed up. And in a quiet stadium, I think that's going to be elevated. But on the field, for you know what we're in terms of what we're going to miss, I think we're going to miss depth at receiver this year a lot. You know, we had a lot of guys on the we had a lot of guys on the field last year that we just don't have anymore. Ceedee Lamb not being there anymore. Really, you know, Charleston Rainbow had a great year last year, but he also had C.D. Lamb taking a lot of attention away from him. I, I don't know how much we're going to have, especially with Jordan Hazelwood and, and Trayshawn Bridges out for right now. You know, I, there's going to be a lot of attention from defenses played to Charleston Rambo. I think about the Baylor game last year when the three freshman receivers came in and kind of saved Oklahoma in that game. Yeah. We just don't have that this year. Yeah. We don't have that that depth secret weapon this year. And that's what really worries me. Again, all the confidence in the world in Lincoln to, to create an offense that makes it work. But that definitely gives me some cause for concern. Those three that you mentioned, Hazelwood to miss the foreseeable future with an undisclosed lower body injury. Of course, Theo Weiss penciled in as the starter at like X, but Trajan Bridges, as of right now, will be suspended for at least the first four games of the Sooners Tough season. Luck. So you look at uh, Obi Obialo, the transfer from yeah. Marshall, as well as Theo Howard, the transfer from UCLA, bringing some experience and some depth to that wide receiver room. Absolutely. Now, we talked about Oklahoma's preeminent opt-out in Kennedy Brooks. Let's talk about the other one, Jalen Redmond, the redshirt sophomore defensive tackle out of Midwest City, former four-star recruit and a guy that has been earning love as a potential first-round NFL draft pick somewhere down the road. Now, in terms of his decision to opt out, it absolutely makes sense. He missed most of his freshman year in 2018 with blood clots, and given the connection between COVID-19 and cardiac issues, he obviously takes more of a risk than his teammates by stepping out there onto the field here in the 2020 season, given the current circumstances. But the Sooners are going to miss him along the offensive line. He led the team with 6.5 sacks in 2019. They're bringing in a junior college transfer in Perion Winfrey, who's penciled in as the week one starter at nose guard. Laron Stokes, another junior college transfer who saw the field a little bit last year for the Sooners, will start at the defensive tackle position. And then obviously uh, you've got Isaiah Thomas and Nick Benito on the outside, guys. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, let's flip it back over to the offensive side of the football. We got to talk right. Spencer Rattler. Of course. He's the, well, hottest, not? <laughs> the hottest topic of discussion among Sooner fans is the new guy at quarterback. Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts all have their Heisman finalist years. Obviously, Mayfield and Murray getting the victories and Hurts the runner up to Joe Burrow. But now, really, for the first time, Lincoln Riley's dealing with a quarterback that he recruited, that he evaluated, that he brought to Oklahoma and who stated earlier in the week in his press conference, Rattler did, uh, that he learned a lot under Jalen Hurts last year. Now as a redshirt freshman, he steps in the former five-star recruit, top overall quarterback in the class of 2019. What are your expectations for Spencer Rattler as he inherits the starting quarterback duty for Oklahoma in 2020? So you just said that he learned a lot from Jalen, right? But I'm expecting Spencer to play a lot like Baker Mayfield. He throws the ball a ton, but I don't know how mobile 
Spencer Rattler is compared to Jalen Hurts and Kyler Murray. But you see this kid, and man, does he have an arm. And wow, he's so accurate. Very similar to Baker Mayfield. I can see him definitely maybe being in the Heisman contestants, maybe. But especially without Kennedy Brooks, who's been carrying the load of running. We're going to have to see if Spencer can get out of his head a little bit and try to emulate more of a running game versus more of a passing game, which he's, bet like, which he's really good at. But I do think that he has a better arm than Jalen, hot take. But I don't think he's as quick on his feet. And I think that can really change now, now that he has Riley's full attention and now that he's able to overcome his own mental ability. I think that the biggest challenge is going to be overcoming himself and not comparing himself a ton to Jalen. But kind of looking more at a Baker old video, like realizing that he can be a lot like that. You just think that he really needs to have explosiveness under center and just pull through and take the run versus the pass. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, my I mean, Baker-esque. He's, he's coming into a great situation. I mean, couldn't ask him to have a better coach. Yeah. Could, you know, he's, he's going he's gonna to draw up some plays for him. I'm, my expectations on Rattler, you know, they're not. They're high. D don't get me wrong, but... They're moderate for OU football expectations, what we expect at the quarterback position at this point. I, you know, he is, you know, I, I feel like we get spoiled. We think there's no way we can have four Heisman finalists in a row. But this kid has got all the talent, and he's just an athletic freak. He was a great high school basketball player, too. That kid can move, got a strong arm, like Shannon says, unbelievably accurate. My, you know, I expect him to have some early freshman mistakes as any freshman quarterback. You know, it's like you're, it's like you're handing a 20-year-old the keys to a Ferrari with this <laughs> offense. <laughs> He's going to go pretty fast. you got to expect him to, you know, maybe put a scratch or two on it. But overall, I expect him to lead. I expect him to perform. He doesn't have to be a Heisman finalist this year, but I expect him to be in New York eventually in his career, 100%. I think that he really needs to maintain his composure too, especially having all eyes on him. Now that he's going to be the starting quarterback, it's all about keeping a keeping a good headspace and just figuring it out, especially with all this pressure that's on him now. Mm -hmm. Definitely, Shannon. And I think what you call the hot take is probably a lukewarm take at best. I don't think anybody <laughs> doubts that Spencer Rattler has by far a better arm than Jalen Hurts. If you watch the two warm up next to each other last year, yeah. you could tell the throws that Hurts could make down the field, Spencer Rattler could throw off his back foot rolling the other direction. Yeah. So. It's never been a question of whether the physical talent is there for Rattler because it very obviously is. The biggest question is going to be maturity and whether Rattler is ready to take on this much responsibility. The first redshirt freshman to start at quarterback for Oklahoma since Trevor Knight in 2013. So it's been a while, <laughs> a while since ago. there was this much inexperience at the quarterback position. Now, let, let me get this clear right off the bat, guys. I'm not saying don't buy the hype here because Rattler is phenomenal. That's what it says on well, the rundown. It says, don't buy the hype. <laughs> Who wrote that? My goodness, okay. <laughs> it said, don't buy it. Our producer, Dylan, and I are going to have to have it out after this is all <laughs> said and done. But listen, here's the thing about Rattler. We know he's got all the physical talent. We've stated it time and time again. But the tools that he has in his bag, the receivers in his arsenal, the running backs in the backfield are not necessarily conducive to the same high level statistical success that we've seen the last three years with Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray and Jalen Hurts. Rattler is working with less than any of those guys had to work with. And that's not to say there won't be breakouts. That's not to say that Charleston Rambo isn't a number one receiver. What I'm saying is let's temper the expectations at the outset here. Let's take an opportunity to see what Rattler can do with what he's been given and what Lincoln Riley has set him up with in this Sooner offense before we start putting Heisman expectations on him. And obviously, that's much easier said than done because of the standout quarterback lineage at the University of Oklahoma and the fact that the last three quarterbacks have all gone to New York. But is it fair to expect Rattler to do that as a redshirt freshman? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Is it certainly so. a possibility? Yes. but. Let's not expect it. All right, back to the defense. Yes, sir. Speed D, let's do it. Year two, back ready. Forth. Alex Grinch, in his second year as Oklahoma defensive coordinator, mentioned in media availabilities earlier this week that he intends to keep pressing takeaways, takeaways, takeaways. The message stays the same. As the Speed D rolls into year two, what are you most excited for, Shannon? I'm excited to see if the defense can finally not hurt the offense. I think that 
this year they're really going to be able to gel together and have that chemistry, especially with more experienced players now like Deshaun White and Trey Brown and Delarian Turner-Yell, of course. I feel like all three of those players gel very well together, and I think that they're finally able to understand Alex Grinch more. I think that the chemistry is going to be better, and I think that Alex Grinch's responsibility is closing the gap between the two by pushing the offense and the defense together into one because they both work well separately. I just think it's that whole gel situation. And I think if they gel well, they got a lock defense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's weird. I'm I'm smiling and I'm talking about OU defense. It's an unusual <laughs> feeling. I don't usually feel happy when I'm talking about OU defense, but I think there is cause to be a little optimistic this year. We took a huge step forward last year. Monumental for OU. We went from 89th to 45th in pass defense. That is a crazy step forward in Grinch's first year. And I expect us to have a similar step forward. We've got four out of our five returning starters in the defensive backfield. That's going to be awesome. Trey Brown coming back. If there's one thing we've learned about Trey Brown, he makes big plays in big games. Think about any Big 12 championship game he's played in. Think about the Baylor game last year when he ran down that game-saving touch, the game-saving touchdown. Our, our defensive line gives me a little pause for concern. You know, I'm, I'm a little worried about that, especially when we get into a school like Oklahoma State that has such a powerful running attack. But I think in terms of, you know, taking the ball away, forcing the turnover, I think we're going to be able to hit more of that goal that Grinch had last year. I think so, too. I think we're finally going to be able to reach the bar and knock it on the head. We just, with how powerful our offense is, our defense just needs to be okay. And I think we're going to be better than okay this year. Now, is this going to be a hearkening back to the Halcyon days of Roy William and Roy Williams and Teddy Lehman? No. But I think, as you mentioned, there is definitely cause to believe that Oklahoma is poised for another step forward mm -hmm. on the defensive side of the football in year two for Alex Grinch. Now, what I'm most interested to see is how things shake out in the linebacker core, because it's no easy task to replace a guy like Kenneth Murray, mm -hmm. who started every single single game of his Sooner career over three seasons and ends up being a first round NFL draft pick. Absolute now, monster. In order to replace him, the Sooners are turning to Deshaun White at the middle linebacker position. He'll slide over from the weak side position and they'll insert Brian Asamoa at the weak. Now both those guys got game experience last year, made some big plays, but who's going to fill the void that Kenneth Murray left in terms of leadership? Because especially when you lose two captains on defense, not just Kenneth Murray, but Neville Gallimore. Yeah. It begs the question, who's going to be the emotional leader there? And I think that has to come from the linebacker core. Now, we saw the Sooners name their captains just a couple days ago. It's Creed Humphrey on the offensive side and Patrick right. Fields on the defensive side. But who's going to step up in that linebacker core and have that tenacity and that ferocity that Kenneth Murray brought? Because that's not an easy thing to replace, but the Sooners definitely have the pieces there in order to approximate the kind of personality and the kind of grit that Kenneth Murray brought to the linebacker position. But still, the Sooners are definitely going to miss him. That, I mean, that oh. hole that Kenneth Murray leaves just cannot be overstated. I mean, he is I, you could not design in a lab a better leader for your defense. Just, yeah. as, just as a man, just as a person, you could not ask for a better defensive leader. But I think that Deshaun White can fit the mold. I think that he has a great personality, a big personality, and can really step up for the role. I don't know if he can emulate K-9, but I still think that he's going to be one of those, especially as a junior, to step up and really take the lead. With, with no fans in the stadium, I mean, we're going to need somebody to get the boys fired up. That's yeah. going to be critical for games this year. Agreed. Back down to our Gaylord Hall studios we go. Coming up next, Tyler DeLuca, Jesse Klinger, and Ben Thomas. Talk Power 5, talk Big 12 teams to watch, and we'll be back with you in about 15 minutes here on Game to You. Hey, welcome back to Game Day U. Every week we're going to have one expert source talk OU football with us. This week it's senior sports reporter for the OU Daily, Chandler Engelbrecht. Chandler, how you doing? Doing well, man. Happy to be here. Happy to be here, man. It's, it's week one. I'm pretty excited. I don't know about you. I'm pretty excited to get football started again. Let's get going. Yeah, let's get this interview going. How about right. that? All right, let's All right. jump right into it. All right, so one guy we know a lot about, a, lot of guy, a guy who gets a lot of coverage is Creed Humphrey. We know him. We know what he's capable of on that offensive line. Everybody else on that offensive line you don't hear a lot about. You know, I think offensive line needs a little bit more respect in general. But anyways, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys on that offensive line maybe we don't know. 
right? What can we expect from that offense? Well, this O-line is returning four starters from last year. Humphrey, of course, is included in that. And that that fifth spot, that right tackle, Anton Harrison, true freshman, is going to be stepping up and, you know, getting his feet wet these first few weeks for the Sooners. And, you know, along with those four starters from a year ago, they were a Joe Moore finalist. Um, and that was a O-line last year that lacked a lot of consistency early on. They had five different starting lineups in the first seven games. And even with that, they still reached Joe, My Joe Moore Award status. So I'm really thinking this year with, with experience back and not as much um, question marks surrounding it, this O-line could, could do very well. Yeah, I know you talked about Anton Harrison and obviously a couple other freshmen are joining the fold, but uh, one thing that you see a lot in college football is those freshmen who, who come in and make an immediate impact. Uh, who's somebody on this roster that you look at and you say, you know what, he can jump in straight from day one and start putting up some numbers? One of the depth chart surprises this week, surprise this week was uh, Marvin Mims, the wide receiver, 5'11", uh, speedy guy, really a playmaker. who's Mr. Texas football in 2019, so that says a lot about him. He knows the system probably as much as anybody else right now, and I really think that week one against a you know, lesser opponent in Missouri State, that he could make a lot of big plays. Yeah, let's switch over to the other side of the ball. One of the guys that I know you wrote an article about recently is Trey Norwood. Uh, he's coming back from injury, and a lot of people are saying, okay, well, he played really well before that injury. Is he going to be able to keep up that play? Is he going to come back and he's going to be that same Trey Norwood, or we maybe you're going to expect better than that? Um, well, Trey Norwood's comeback story is very unique. He's a guy who, around this time a year ago, did suffer that ACL injury, and it sidelined him up until this confusing offseason that we're going through. But I had the privilege of talking to uh, his family himself and a few of his former coaches, and all of them say he's coming back better than ever. Um, he didn't become that top cornerback uh, on the depth track this week. He's right behind Jaden Davis, but I really think that he could uh, return to that bright spot on the defense that he was two years ago. He was popping up, he was making some big plays, he's just a freshman sophomore. So now, redshirt junior year, a lot more experience under his belt as he kind of returns to a healthy status. I think he could make big plays this year for the Sooners. Okay, so one of the things that you mentioned there is that spotlight, right? And that spotlight was on Kenneth Murray a lot last year, and now obviously he's off with the Chargers. Uh, so who takes Kenneth Murray's spot in this defense? Well, taking his exact spot will be Deshaun White, who's a junior now, so he's no stranger to this defense. He's played in 28 games for him. He started 14 of those, so I really don't think they're going to lose too much at that position. Uh, Deshaun White has proved to be a playmaker in, in you know, years past, so I really don't think they're going to lose too much at that linebacker core, and I really think it'll probably be the most experienced position group on the defense this year. Chandler, thank you for doing this interview with me, man. It means a lot. We got our, our segment done here. Uh, but now we're going to go back to Tyler. But first, I want to plug the OU Football Preview. You guys can pick that up anywhere on campus. Chandler's got a couple articles in there. You guys make sure to check those out, read those articles. Uh, kind of study up on your OU football a little bit because we got a season to go, right? All right, all right? All right, Tyler, back to you in the studio, man. Thanks, guys. Well, a lot of college football fans aren't going to be able to watch their team play for a few months. So, Ben, Jesse, what team should they start watching that they might not have had on their radar before? My non-Power 5 pick is the co-champions from 2017, oh, oh, the UCF no. Knights. Oh, yes, they God. open up the season ranked 21st, one of the very few non-Power 5 conference teams to be open up the season ranked, and they finished the last three season ranked, 24th, 11th, and then that famous year, 6th in the rankings. I mean, they are always competing in the AAC, they have won it two, uh, three out of the last four years. They have a great head coach, a former OU player in Josh Heupel as their head coach. 16 starters back. Quarterback Dylan Gabriel is coming back after a solid freshman season, passing for 3,600 yards, 29 touchdowns, just seven interceptions. Eight starters on the defense returning. That defense held opponents to only 23 points per game last year. Three running backs that they can just hand the ball off to and be workhorses. Plus, they have Jalen Robinson, who was a transfer wide receiver from Oklahoma, joining their wide receiver core. I mean, I think you just got to keep an eye on these guys. I don't, I don't know if they're going to win another natty, but I think they're a really solid pick for a non-Power 5 team to watch. And they're just a fun team to watch. Always explosive. A lot of highlights. Yeah, they're sure. a good team. I cannot believe you just said that. I know my family's going to be really mad at me. <laughs> I cannot wait for the show to end, and they're, you're just going to have your phone blowing up saying, how could you betray your family like this? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, family. You're not sorry. sorry. Well, I think the obvious choice is the Cincinnati Bearcats, UCF's biggest competition this season, and last season, too. You say UCF was 21. Y'all, the Cincinnati Bearcats were number 20. UCF went 10 to 3. Bearcats went 11 to 2. There you have a killer offense and defense and earlier this week cbs and other sports experts predicted that the bearcats are going to make it to the playoffs did they predict ucf i, I don't think so i think it was the bearcats yeah i can't wait for them to be <laughs>
especially since the Big Ten and Pac-12 aren't playing, it's just going to boost their chances to get into the playoffs even more. And besides, who's going to step up in the wake of wide receiver Gabriel Davis for UCF? Do you know? No. Jalen Robinson, the OU transfer. Ooh. Oh, he's going to step really? right in. He does know. Really? Hey, I mean, you get to be a part of Lincoln Riley's system for even a, a day or two. Yeah, already a big increase. Something. I mean, yeah. they're going to be big. Cincinnati will be good though. Regardless, Cincinnati Bearcats, I'm cheering for y'all. Can't wait for them it. to be upset by UCF this oh, year. Oh, I can't wait for your parents to be upset with you. Yeah, Ooh, that's man. true. <laughs> Ooh, man. Good Get fire. hot in here. All right, well, my pick, you know how I like my dark horses. Yeah. So wow. speaking of horses, I'm going down south. Give me the SMU Mustang sticking in the American Conference. We okay. saw them play Texas State. A win is a win. Let me just let me just say that. A win is a win. I don't care if it's 31-24. It was a little ugly, but a win is a win. And, I mean, Shane Buscelli put up good passing yards in that game, but overall was not great with one touchdown and two interceptions. Not what you want from your quarterback. That's not a good ratio. I don't expect this to be a trend, though, for the Mustangs QB when looking at his incredible stats from last season. He put up nearly 4,000 yards passing with 34 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. The offensive firepower is absolutely still there for the Mustangs this season, even after losing some of their rushing attack. They have defensive end Turner Cox as well, who can play all over the field. That is, that is one of the most versatile defenders that I, I've seen this year so far. And he had a very solid season last year, and I expect to see him all over the field being an anchor for this defense. We saw him get a sack against Texas State, and he can absolutely help lead this team to the American Conference Championship and dethrone both of your guys' team. Because let me, let me ask you a question. Hypothetically, right, if this season was to get postponed, you know, in a worst case scenario, yeah. and UCF is still undefeated, do they claim another title? I mean, I wouldn't put it past them, yeah. honestly. I mean, if they got the right wins and everything, I wouldn't put it past them. Yeah, I mean, I, I can think, see. I think, I think, I, hey, don't count out a national championship team. Yeah. Never count them out. Yeah, I think the American is going to be a great conference to watch this year. Definitely. But also, we're, we're here in Oklahoma. We are here with the five-time reigning Big 12 champions here at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. But what team in the Big 12 poses the biggest threat to that championship reign over the Big 12? So a lot of people are talking about Oklahoma State and Texas. Obviously, my pick, though, Iowa State Cyclones. Mm. They always give OU such great games, really tough. They even upset us a couple times here and there. They're a really good team, and they just have a ton of experience. Brock Purdy is back at quarterback, one of the best, if not the best quarterback in the Big 12 over Sam Ellinger, I think. He threw for close for 4,000 yards, 27 touchdowns. He has a huge throwing arm, can just throw downfield, light it up. He's got all the receivers he needs. He's got a top three tight end in the Big 12 in Charlie Kohler. But big for Iowa State, I think this year will be their defense. Finished third in Big 12 scoring defense, fifth overall, and was able to hold up really well against the run, which is a really big attack in the Big 12. They have two returning linebackers in Mike Rose and Orion Vance. They combined for 10 sacks, 18 and a half tackles for a loss last season. And I think, and they're coming back, they're going to be explosive off the sides. They're going to really be able to attack the quarterback well. And I think, but the biggest thing for Iowa State will be to keep an eye on their running backs. That was their biggest weakness last year as they were 0-5 when none of their running backs rushed over 100 yards in a game last year. So I really think Iowa State's offense will have to help out their defense, which usually in the Big 12, you don't really hear that that often. Mm -hmm. But I really truly believe Iowa State has a really solid defense that will compete with anybody in the Big 12. No, I am with you on that one right there. I think Iowa State is going to give some of the Big 12 schools a run for their money this season. Like you said, Brock Purdy, he is one of the best quarterbacks in the Big 12 right now. 100%. And last year wasn't their best season, but I really think that this year is their time to shine. They have like three really strong power players. One, Brock Purdy, who you just talked about, and then especially running back Brees Hall. He didn't start the first half of the season last year, but when he did, he ran with it. He got nine touchdowns and averaged 4.9 yards per carry, rushing for 897 yards, despite not starting the first half of the season. Another person to keep your eye on is junior Charlie Kohler. He's the tight end from here in Norman, Oklahoma. He's one of the best tight ends in college football in general right now. He had 51 catches for 697, coming off the best season for a tight end in school history. He considered entering the draft early this year, but he decided to stick around. And I really think that Iowa State is going to benefit from that. Like we said, they've, they've always given OU a great game. And I think that Iowa State is going to give every school in the Big 12 a great game this year. There's a lot of uncertainty, as we've discussed, 
but I think that Iowa State has a really solid team right now with players with really good experience, great stats, and they're just going to kill it. I already know it. I see a lot of upsets. Oh, That's yeah, lots of upsets. Beating, I can see them even being a sleeper pick for a Big 12 championship game oh, wow. against OU. I really think so. I think they have a lot of experience. I mean, every offense in the Big 12 is really good. I yeah, mean, they're always sure. one of the best. And Brock Purdy, I think, will, you will see a huge growth in him. I don't really see him as like a Heisman candidate, but I think he will do enough to push that team and be able to squeak in. They'll have to get a few wins, good wins over like an Oklahoma State and a Texas. But I, I think they might be able to sneak in. Oh, for sure. I really sure. think so. I really for think sure. so. Sure. Well, about you, Tyler? I talked about Dave Aranda earlier, so I'm taking it back to Waco. Give me the Baylor Bears as my Big 12 sleeper. And I understand. There's a lot of mountains for this team to climb, but we can't act like this team is not the same program that took the Big 12 championship almost away from us. Like that was, we had to come back in a miraculous game. That was insane. And that is the same program. Like they're not going away. They ranked number seventh in the nation at the end of the, at the, end of the year last year. And they have, they have such a unique season uh, right now, especially with the coaching change during this climate. It's going to be tough. And I, I am not disregarding that at all. But I absolutely think that they could be led by quarterback Charlie Brewer and, and get there. And after ret he's returning for after throwing over 3,000 yards and 21 touchdowns, on top of that, he ran full 11 touchdowns. So obviously he spent some time in injured and that's been tough. But we saw here last year at OU how much, how much importance there is to having versatility at quarterback with Jalen Hurts. If they can get that same type of production from Charlie Brewer that we saw from Jalen Hurts last year, there's no reason why they can't be up in that upper echelon of the Big 12 once again this year. Yeah, I think Charlie Brewer obviously will be the, the big factor there for Baylor. But going back to your point that you mentioned, you, they're only having two starters come back mm -hmm. on defense. I really think that's going to be tough. In an offensive-powered yeah. conference, I get it you have a defensive-minded coach. Mm -hmm. But in a, like I said, in an offensive-powered conference, it's really tough if you have to just be plugging in new guys into a brand new system. Yeah, it's true. going to be really tough to adjust. I think they'll get their wins over teams like Kansas, who might make a little bit of a jump, but maybe not so much under Les Miles. But I think they'll be able to beat your TCUs, your Techs, mm -hmm. teams that are kind of just sitting there on the bubble of maybe they might have a breakout year, but maybe not. So I, I see them, like I mentioned earlier, just kind of like a middle-of-the-pack team, mm -hmm. I, like a middle-of-the-pack Big 12 team. But I think you're going to see you know, your Oklahoma, your Oklahoma State, your Texas towards the top there. Yeah. So what do you guys think kind of about Texas? Like, obviously, that's our biggest rival here. They have usually the biggest threat to our Big 12 reign. Where do you guys see them kind of placing the Big 12 and what impact they'll have? I'm kind of in between. I honestly think this season can go either way for them. I mean, either they can be a powerhouse or, like you said, they're going to be one of those little just, you know, sitting there kind of, kind of teams. Hopefully they give OU a good game, but um, – and compared to the rest of the Big 12, I don't really know if they have a chance. Oh, but that's wow. just me personally. I don't know. Okay. Man, maybe, that's... maybe a little bit of okay. a chance, Fair. but not like take the Fair. national championship. Yeah, I mean, chance. Texas always somehow finds a way to disappoint their fans <laughs> um, with every season. And I, I, I get the hype around Sam Ellinger. I get it. From what I've watched in my three years here, I've never really seen anything too special. He's a good quarterback. Yeah, for I'm sure. not going to. Yeah, for sure. I'm 100% yeah. he's a good quarterback. But I wouldn't put him as like a top three quarterback. So you don't, you don't think Sam Ellinger can carry Texas to either a national championship or Big 12 championship level? I don't think so. You don't no. think so? I really don't think so. I think their biggest thing for them will, like in the Big 12, will ultimately come down to their defense. They always mention how they're DBU, yep. but six of their DBs couldn't stop C.D. Lamb on mm. one play last year. Yeah. So, I mean, it's one of those things where their defense is going to be critical. I don't really think they're going to – they always do really well in recruiting. Tom Herman's really good at recruiting, but he never really finds that next gear, that next yeah. switch. And I think that will be the thing that Texas needs to do to really get back to the top yeah. and be back. Yeah, well, that's what I was about to say. We, we'll have to wait until this season to see if Texas is back. But when game day U comes back, we'll send it to Parker, Kemper, and Shannon for the final time as they give us final words and a score prediction before tonight's game between the Sooners and the Bears. Stay tuned. Here for one final segment, Parker Thune, Shannon Earhart, and Kemper Ball. 
Guys, let's take a quick spin around the Big 12 before we dig into tonight's matchup for Oklahoma. And let's start with Oklahoma State, a team that's getting a lot of love here in the preseason, 15th or 16th, depending on which rankings metrics you prefer. But a team solidly in the top 20, at least in the eyes of the pollsters, and bring, bring a lot of hype into the 2020 season. Uh, now, Shannon, here on the rundown, next to your name, it says Talent But Gundy. Care to elaborate <laughs> on your thoughts on Oklahoma State there? I do care to elaborate, Parker. Well, I think that OSU has the talent, but they don't have the mind to do it. Mike Gundy is not the guy to do it at all. I, he does have the worst record ever in every bedlam game against <laughs> OU as and any OU coach even though he has the most winningest record for OSU. So let me know how that balance is. Also, I think that the team has a lot of talent, but literally Mike Gundy has done nothing with it against OU or against a lot of other teams too. He's always choked, you guys. Last year, they had it in the bag and they choked. And I don't know how that happened, but I think that Gundy also could lose the locker room really quick on a flip of coin easily and I know that Kemper you might have something to say about that but I think that he also is on very thin ice with, with his team and I just don't think that Gundy is the guy to do it I don't think he has the right mindset yeah you know I think offensively this team's got talent all over the field they're scary offensively Chuba Hubbard everyone knows about he's my pick to win the Heisman Trophy he's he's gonna get his he's gonna get his yards he's gonna get his touchdown I worry about you know if you know, COVID cancellations, if this season ends up not looking as impactful as it could, I worry about him stepping back a little bit and deciding, oh, maybe I don't need to run the ball 30 times a game anymore. And really taking himself out of that offense. But I think it goes beyond Chuba. I really like Spencer Saunders. I think he's a good quarterback. I don't think he's stellar. He's got like the 15th Heisman odds right now. I don't think we'll ever see him in New York. But he's, he's a decent player, and they've also got a preseason All-American receiver, Taylor Wallace. He's a Blitnikoff finalist in 2018 before, and he was going to be a Blitnikoff finalist before injury sidelined him in 2019. There's talent all over the field in Stillwater. I agree with what you're saying about Mike Gundy potentially losing the locker room. I mean, he had so many off off the field issues yeah. this off season between the between the shirt, between all that. But you know, I, I think they've got the talent to make it happen. Well, the good news is Game Day U isn't syndicated on One American News Network, so Mike Gundy and the Pokes will never have any idea that we're dragging them. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, here's my take, Kemper and Shannon. Spencer Sanders is getting benched mid-season. Really? What? Come what? on. Really? That's a hot take. That's I know. a very hot out. take. Fabrication. Woo! Hear me out Fabrication. Here. The Pokes got Shane Illenworth sitting there on the bench. Woo! The number six quarterback recruiting the class of 2020. I was not impressed Freshman. with Spencer Sanders in 2019. I think he held the Cowboys back from bigger things. He's turnover prone. He's inconsistent. Yes, he's athletic, but especially with Tylen Wallace on the outside, you need a guy who's going to be able to get him the ball with regularity and not make mistakes and not turn the ball over and not throw the ball to the other team. I think that guy's Shane Illingworth. I don't think it's Spencer Sanders. I think you see four or five stars from Sanders and Mike Gundy decides to go a different direction. You let me know how that works out for you. All right. You we'll call do. me and you tell me when they put him in and bench Spencer. I just think you're, you're holding a lot of freshman mistakes against Spencer and your solution to that is let another freshman come in and play quarterback why wouldn't you ride the wave you know you've gotten through the freshman mistakes let Sa Sanders Saunders on how you pronounce it let's see what he's got this year he's all got right. talent let's see him use it all right well we're running short of time so I'll get off my soapbox there <laughs> Oklahoma State down to Waco let's talk about the Baylor Bears a team that was only beaten in the regular season last year by Oklahoma good game they lost to Great them game. in Waco on November 16th and then again in overtime in the Big 12 championship. Does Baylor have what it takes to repeat their unprecedented mm -hmm. level of success last year, Shannon? Well, I think they could have it if Charlie Brewer is there to perform. It's now his senior year, and he needs to be in the right mindset to lead this team if he wants to be victorious. Especially with a new coach, Brewer needs to step up and be the leader for this team. And if he, he can have a good season and he can keep the glass half full, then I think that his team will too. But I think it all relies on the shoulders of Charlie Brewer. And if Charlie Brewer can help lead this team and keep the energy up, especially with the pandemic going on, new freshmen, everything else is all jumbled up. I think that if he can really stay on his game and stay in his, stay out of his head, I think that Baylor could be dangerous. I think it is a possibility. 
The question I was asked when preparing for this show was, is Baylor dangerous? Not can they repeat the success of last year? Because the job Matt Rule did in Waco last year is one of the greatest coaching jobs I've ever seen. Baylor had no business being that good last year, but they were somehow. Now they've got a new coach. They've got Dave Aranda from LSU this year. And I think they're still dangerous. They're not gonna be as dangerous as they were last year, but they're dangerous. There's not a ton of returning quarterbacks in the Big 12 this year, so the fact that they have Charlie Brewer coming back is gonna be big. I think it's gonna be a strong defensive year in the Big 12, so that's an advantage that they're going to hold. I think they could be a dangerous matchup for us, for teams like Oklahoma State and Texas, the top teams, but I don't see them as a Big 12 title contender. Second hot take of the segment here. <laughs> Baylor's going four and six this year. Four and six, you can Ooh. book that. Charlie Brewer has taken one too many shots to the head. Gary Bohannon can't throw the ball downfield. There's no more Denzel Mims, and Matt Rule is gone off to Carolina. I don't see it this year for the Bears. I think they regress back to mediocrity in a very significant way. Even with Dave Aranda at the helm, I just don't see it happening. Quickly here, guys, any surprises in your mind in the Big 12 standings, top to bottom? Honestly, yes. Um, well, my first is obviously going to be Oklahoma. I mean, it's guaranteed. They've been in the college playoffs the past four of the five, past four of the past five seasons. And then I'm going to have to go with Texas, always a challenger. Then TCU, OSU. We talked about it earlier. We talked about Chuba Hubbard, Spencer Sanders. I think that could be pretty nasty. And I think they could sneak up on us. And then I'm going to have to go number five with Baylor, potential with Charlie Brewer and stuff. And then K State, Iowa State. Iowa State's not great on paper, but they did upset both OU and TCU last season, so you never know what could happen there. Didn't and then I'm going to have season. to go with Tech, West Virginia, and then, sorry, Kemper, but Kansas, bottom of the barrel. No, shameful. No, they are just shameful. If they can step up and they can perform this year, I'll give them a round of applause, a pat on the back, but... Jay Hawk slander will not be tolerated on game day U this year. Okay? I... I don't have a ton of surprises. I've got OU winning the Big 12, obviously, and I've got OSU coming in second, but if you look a little bit further down, I couldn't disagree more about your Iowa State take. That's my big disagreement. They got Brock Purdy returning. He is a, like I said in my last, uh, my last argument about uh, Baylor, returning quarterbacks are a commodity in the Big 12 this year. I really like Brock Purdy. I think he's got the potential to be a first round draft pick. So I've got them coming in at around four or five, and then my team to watch, my big surprise, Shannon kind of spoiled it, but it's the Kansas Jayhawks. <laughs> Year two under Les Miles. Puka Williams is coming back as their running back. And guys, COVID-19's got everyone's stadiums empty. Kansas has been playing in empty stadiums in Lawrence for years. I have never seen that stadium full. They've got an advantage there. I really like it. I think Kansas gets their first Big 12 win in a few years this year. Hmm. I'll keep it short and sweet. Oklahoma's going to be at the top. Kansas is going to be at the bottom. Mm. Everybody else will be somewhere in between. That's what it amounts to in the Big 12, and that's what it's going to be like for the foreseeable future in that I like conference. That, Parker. At least until Les Miles can get his recruits in that system. They're coming. I, I don't see what you're seeing. I up don't know. There in I Lawrence. don't know. You guys didn't watch enough Puka Williams last Put year. Put your glasses on. All right, guys. We've talked big picture. Now let's zone in on this game here tonight between Oklahoma and Missouri State. Final words, Shannon. What do you got? I have positivity. I think that the Sooners are going to have to stay positive through this, have a good mindset, and just not think about the pandemic when they're playing. Just really go out there, come out strong, and just not getting ahead of themselves. I think that they really just need to be there, be in the present, not think about the past or the future, just be in the now and stay positive. My final word, I'm going with tone. We've got to set the tone early, not just for this game, but for this season. I said earlier that it feels like at times OU has had a tendency to come out flat and look like they're just not mentally ready to play. And that's going to be harder to get up to play when there aren't 90,000 fans screaming for you. We're going to have, I mean, Lincoln's got to have the boys ready to play, got to set the tone for the season with energy and with intensity. My final word is relish. And here's why. Hungry. In today's day and age, given the current circumstances around the country and around the world, and the fact that we're dealing with a global pandemic, you never know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't know if at some point the college football season is going to have to come to a crashing halt. There's absolutely no telling how this season plays out here in 2020. Oklahoma has the chance to get back on the gridiron, albeit against a low-level FCS opponent here tonight. Relish that opportunity. Don't take it for granted because you don't know 
if you're going to be stepping on the field again next week. That's the hope and that's the expectation, but it's by no means a certainty. So, Sooners, relish this one tonight. You know, Parker, you're making me want a hot dog. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, got I can say. do it. Go ambiguous. I can do it. Word. I got you there. All right, Shannon. Final score prediction between the Sooners and the Bears. I'm going to have to go 52-14. Oh, you, obviously. But I think that there's going to be a couple of holes being the first game that they let Missouri State slip through a little bit, maybe through the cracks. But I think that OU overall is going to dominate, just absolutely obliterate Missouri State. So that's my take. Yeah, not a whole lot of difference here. 45-13. You know, I don't see the offense accelerating this fast to put up the 50-burger as much as I would like the 50-burger tonight. And then, you know, I think 13 points is reasonable to expect the defense to give up in in a small step for, you know. Last year it might have been 25 points. As you might expect, I'm taking the Sooners to win. Shocker. I think the score, Kemper and Shannon, is going to be 66-0. to zero. Yes, Woo! I am predicting Parker, a shutout. No mercy. I am predicting a shutout. I said a step forward That's, on defense, not a listen. Lead. Don't overthink this, people. Oklahoma's coming off their third consecutive trip to the college football playoff. Missouri went one and eleven last year at the FCS level. This is as much of a mismatch as is conceivable. I would frankly be shocked if Missouri State gets past midfield on the Oklahoma oh. defense. That's just how much of a mismatch this game is. I expect Lincoln Riley to be empty in the bench by the third quarter, get everybody some good healthy run, see what some of those more talented freshmen like Reggie Grimes and Marvin Mims can bring to the table. But I think it's a shellacking tonight, we were, we were talking. You were talking about Charlie Brewer's head earlier. I think you've taken a few too many shots to the head, man. You got some <laughs> crazy takes today. You got some crazy takes. I like takes. the positivity, though. <laughs> Gotta say. All right, folks. Well, as long as the Sooners are playing football, we'll be here with you every Every Saturday morning giving you a full preview of the Sooners contest and all the contests across the nation here on Game Day U. Coming up next, Tyler DeLuca, Jesse Klinger, and Ben Thomas will take you all the way to the finish line. This is Game Day U. Welcome back to Game Day U. We have a few minutes left, so let's round out the show with our picks for week two of college football. First off, Ben, tell me which game I should turn my TV to this weekend. Game to turn on, turn on is Duke versus number 10 Notre Dame. I'm really not that sold on Notre Dame this season, so I think Duke can walk into to Notre Dame and just I think it'll be a close game, but I think they could take it by maybe a field goal. I'm going to have to, my game to watch is Georgia Tech versus Florida State. It's going to be an interesting game. They're not ranking schools, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And it's, the question is, is how quickly can Florida State's new head coach generate the offensive explosiveness that defined his Memphis team through the past 38 wins over the past four seasons? It's, it's going to be interesting what Florida State has in store for the team. Yeah, and I'm going to go with Clemson and Wake Forest. And we all know kind of what we're getting with Clemson at this point. They're a machine. Trevor Lawrence is going to be fantastic. But I'm interested in seeing who is going to step up and be that number one receiver for the Tigers this year. Because we saw people going to the draft. We've seen injuries. They have a mix of both seniors, you know, juniors, and then freshmen and sophomores as well. They have old and new faces. They have a great roster. They have depth there. But I'm just interested to see who is going to step up for sure. And now the next game that we're going to look at, we're going to stick in the ACC. Let's go Florida State and Georgia Tech. Who do you guys have? I got Florida State taking this one. I really like them. I think they are going to win by two touchdowns. I think new head coach Mike Norvell is legit. I think he's an up-and-coming coach in college football. Like you said, very high-powered offense at Memphis. Memphis, not a team really known for football, has been excelling the past few years under Mike Norvell. James Blackman is back at quarterback. He was really good for them before getting injured. I think he'll just only take off. And they have talent up and down the field. Florida State used to be a powerhouse. They still recruit well. I think you're going to really see Florida State turn it around this season. I agree. I'm also going for Florida State as well. They have really good defense and an early edge because of their massive returning talent and the new coach. I really think it's going to be a really interesting dynamic to their team, especially with their quarterback. I think it's going to be a great season for Florida State. You know what? Give me Georgia Tech. And I understand that saying that Georgia Tech was bad last year is probably an understatement. I understand that completely. But we have to kind of take into consideration everything that was going on. They have new head coach Jeff Collins switching from a triple option to a spread. This roster was, was made for the triple option, but now he has his own recruits. He has 20 of his, of his top 21 defensive tacklers returning. I think it might not be a huge jump, but I think Georgia Tech does take a jump this year. And I think we see that starting today against Florida State. So sticking in the ACC, 
Syracuse and North Carolina. The last game that they played was two seasons ago, double overtime classic. Who do you guys got? You got me, man. I'm picking UNC yeah. Tar Heels. Oh, no. Only by a field goal, though. So you can't underestimate Syracuse, but I do see Mac Brown and the boys building off their number 12 ranked offense in total yards and just excelling against Syracuse today. I do see them picking up the win. Like you mentioned earlier, Sam Howell. Yep. You talked about him as your sleeper yep. Heisman pick. I mean, 3,600 yards, 38 touchdowns, seven picks as a freshman, as a true freshman. I, I see him building off that, and I do see UNC squeaking by Syracuse, and a lot of it will be from uh, how Sam Howell plays uh, later today. I don't care how much you argue about North don't, Carolina. Don't. Ooh, uh -oh. I'm cheering for Syracuse. I'm choosing Syracuse. They have come a long way in a year, and their quarterback, Tommy DeVito, he's carrying high expectations for the season, and I'm really interested to see what he will bring to the field. Yeah, we can talk about Sam Howell however long you want, but I'm sorry, I cannot agree with you on that. I'm going to have to cheer for Syracuse, and I think they're going to win. Bold. Wow. Big pick. After everything I've said about North Carolina <laughs> this show, that is still not enough to convince you that this team is legit. I don't know Here what else go. to say. Mac Brown is a championship-level coach. Sam Howell is a Heisman-level talent. They are going to destroy Syracuse. I see no chance for the Orange to win this. I think Howell is going to put this team on his shoulders and they are going to go however far he takes them and that's going to be enough easily to get past the Orange today. And lastly in the ACC, Notre Dame and Duke. Who do you guys have on that one? Like I mentioned earlier, as my game to watch. I got Duke in this one, just edging Notre Dame by a field goal. Like I said, I'm not sold on Notre Dame, never have been. Ian Book is a solid quarterback, but I really don't think he takes them to the next level. Notre Dame's always just a solid team, but I see Duke just come, kind of coming out of nowhere and just totally beating the Fighting Irish with their new transfer quarterback, Chase Bryce from Clemson. Wow. I mean, Clemson produces studs, so I really think he's going to take over and Duke's going to beat Notre Dame today. That's my upset pick. I'm going to have to say Notre Dame. I'm sorry to disagree with you. Wait, no, I'm not. I think <laughs> that nothing, enough, nothing has changed enough for either of these two teams to make any weird predictions about this game today. I'm going to have to go with Notre Dame because having an experienced quarterback is more important than ever this season, and that's what they have with Tommy Reese. So it's Notre Dame for me. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree uh, with Jesse here. I can't talk this good about UNC and then go and pick Duke. It just can't happen. <laughs> no. And, you know, the Notre Dame, you know, I'm kind of with you. I'm not 100% sold on Notre Dame. I don't know if they're amazing. But you just have to be pretty good to beat Duke. I, 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 don't, I don't have very high expectations for Duke. So I think Notre Dame absolutely pulls this one off. And finally, let's take it back to Norman. OU yes. and Missouri State play today. It, it might be, you know, maybe it's a close game. Maybe. What do you guys think? I got 70 to 7 OU. Oh, uh, <laughs> starters are off by the midway through the first quarter. I'm sorry, Missouri State. I don't even see it being close. The boys look ready to, yeah. to ball right now. I don't know if it's going to be that high, but it's definitely going to be a stark high scoring game for sure. Yeah, I mean, I agree. To say this is a mismatch is an absolute understatement. This is like Muggsy Bogues. This is Muggsy Bogues just guarding Shaq in the post. Like, this is, <laughs> this is a huge mismatch. And I just can't see any way that Missouri State doesn't lose by like 35. Like, it's going to be. A bloodbath. Oh, 100%. And then oh, yeah. finally, upset picks. What do you guys have? Not a whole lot to choose from, but I'm going Western Kentucky over Louisville. A lot of people have been riding high on Louisville this season, but I just don't think so. I think Western Kentucky can walk in to, uh, Kentucky, to Louisville and just beat them. I think it'll just be a straight touchdown win. Um, they're a little weak at quarterback. They lost two quarterbacks, one to the draft and one to the transfer portal. But other than that, a very veteran team, four returning linemen, returning running backs, a lot of their receiving core is back. And then they have D'Angelo Malone at defensive back leading this defense. He was a Conference USA Defensive Player of the Year with 11 and a half sacks and 21 tackles for loss. They didn't lose a whole lot of starters on defense, only losing two. I really think Western Kentucky can kind of just walk right into Louisville, give them a really good game against a team that a lot of people see as a sneak team in the, a in the ACC. Excuse me. Yeah. I mean, and like I said before, I'm a big advocate for Iowa State right now, but I think Lafayette is going to be the upset today. Oh, They're wow. coming off the best season in their program after winning 11 games and claiming the Sun Belt West Division Championship for the second year in a row. And 
sorry, pardon me here. I think they came off a really great season last year. And like I said, Iowa State is going to have a great season for sure. But I just don't think it's going to start today, maybe next week, guys. Yeah, and honestly, I, I like both those picks, but I see no upsets. Looking across the board, obviously our schedules are a little weird this year, you know, with conferences, you know, not playing as much. I just don't see an upset. I don't, I don't think there's any, you know, kind of high-ranked matches where you see, like, a top-10 team playing, like, a, you know, closer to a 25-ranked team, something like that. There's no matchups, like, you know, there's no trap games. Anything in that area, I, I just don't see happening just because of the reduced schedule. Those type of games just aren't even occurring here this season, and I just, I just don't see it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's kind of tough, like you mentioned, with the schedule. We see a couple games with, like, Clemson playing Wake Forest. Wake Forest is not that good of a team, mm -hmm. but any team can win on any yeah. given day. Yeah, absolutely. And so you really can't count anybody out. But like you said, when you look, just look at, the, look at, at it on paper, yeah. there's really no team that you can look at and go, yeah, this yeah, team's sure. going to upset I mean, just, this team. Just when you think you have college football figured out, you college don't. football does, just goes and takes a left turn and – everything just becomes chaos. It's like March Madness, yeah. you know? Yeah, know. absolutely. You just yeah, never abso know. Absolutely. It's gonna be real I just tough. don't see anything on the schedule. No, like I said, Duke, I think, is a, no a good one. And like, like I said, you just gotta keep an eye on teams like Awake Forest, like mm -hmm. uh, Louisiana Tech against ranked teams. It's just, you never know what can happen. And it's yeah. the first day of college football in this setting in 2020. Literally, you never know what's gonna happen. Yeah. All right, all right, guys, before we get out of here, so we just did our upset picks. So I just want to thank everybody for watching Game Day U here today. Uh, make sure you follow us here on the socials. We will be returning here for the 26th for OUK State. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Ben Thomas, Jesse Klinger, and the whole crew, I'm Tyler DeLuca. Have a fun and safe game day, and we'll see you next time.